Now, with uh, no further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Megan Mullinax, who's with the great company ACRT, which is the only national independent utility vegetation management consulting firm, and it is owned by its uh, employ. I guess employees are self. I'm, you, you'll have to explain that, Megan. But uh, thank you for joining us and uh, enlightening us on this topic. And I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Let me get my screen shared. All right, can everybody see that all right? Looks good. Okay. Let me see if I can get rid of the video on my end so I can see everything real quick. All right. So like you said, we are, um, an employee-owned company, so and we are not owned by any tree care company um, in the industry, and so that does make us a fully independent company that can come in and give you an objective opinion on the vegetation in your right-of-ways. Um, so, like you said, my name is Megan Mullinex. Mullinex. <laughs> I'm a business development manager with ACRT. Um, I've been with ACRT since 2018. Um, I came on to help out with the response to Hurricane Michael. Um, prior to that, I worked with North Georgia EMC as their system arborist, and prior to that, I um, got into this industry by getting involved with the Georgia Tree Council um, and becoming a, a city arborist for the city of Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. That's just a little bit about, about me and how I got started. So my family is from Northwest Georgia, and we've been in Northwest Georgia for over 100 years. Um, one of the very interesting things about it, and you guys may know, being you know being around the Cumberland Plateau as well, is that it is the world's longest hardwood forested plateau. And so I spent a lot of my time on the hundred acres I grew up in, um, looking at trees, managing trees. You know, I I learned how to use a chainsaw at an early age. Um, my parents' driveway was half mile long, and my dad was in the military, so he wasn't always home to get. Uh, fallen trees off the property. So it was something I was very comfortable with at an early age. Um, I used to manage a garden center and greenhouse um, for a number of years uh, throughout my 20s and teach for the National Garden Clubs of America. Uh, one of the very interesting things about my county, uh, Walker County, Georgia, is we have um, the deepest drop in a cave system in the United States. And when I brought this up uh, previously, when I did this talk, everybody wanted a picture of this drop. So this next slide is just a picture of what that drop looks like. I've also included what the mouth of the cave looks like, because usually when people come to visit me, they're like, oh, let's go see the cave. And I'm like, you don't understand. This is not a tourist attraction. You know, this is not something that locals even, you know, typically do. Uh, but that is the the opening to the cave is incredibly small. Um, you have to be a, a skilled individual to enter this cave system. But it is um, 586 feet uh, deep. So pretty, pretty exciting. That's where I kind of got started. And that's where um, I really found my love for nature. And I, I've worked in the green industry my entire life. Um, whether it's with cities, utilities, or uh, with growing plants. So that's a little bit about me before we get started. So at ACRT, we were really founded on two things, training and safety. And so before I get started, um, I'm just going to do a very brief uh, safety talk. So one of the things, and I've always, always uh, preached this to people I work with, is slow down and take a little bit of time before you start work. Um, just check that you have everything you need, check your surroundings, and just, you know, really evaluate your situation before you get started, no matter what you're doing, you know. And um, at the end of your project, kind of review that. Review what happened and what went well, what didn't go well, and anything that, you know, like a near-miss situation that maybe you could avoid in the future. So, but like Neil said, the goals of this webinar are, um, it's, a, it's a basic introduction to utility vegetation management. And it is going to be very wordy. 
So feel free to screenshot and different things like that or reach out to me later um, because it, there's a lot that goes into utility vegetation management. So this uh, webinar, I try to put as much as I can into the, the basics and the history of utility vegetation management planning. Um, and also, I would like you guys to get a little bit of an understanding of the research and regulations that go into UVM, which is utility vegetation management. Um, and a lot of people think we just trim trees and it's, it goes a lot deeper than that. You are really, when you're planting vegetation in a right of way, you're not just looking at the trees. You're also looking at all the grasses and forbs, any protected species that may be involved, you know, whether that's, uh, insects, you know, all the way up to bats, different mammals. So it, it really is a, a larger, um, job than just, just pruning trees. Um, and then finally, I do want to bring home that integrated vegetation management is a, it's really a vital part of utility vegetation management. If you want to effectively handle invasive species and mitigate vegetation in your right of ways, it, it's a tool that you need to be using. So first off, I want to talk about the history of uh, utility planning or right away planning. Um, so we've found oh, throughout history, if there have been roads, there's been vegetation management, right? And when railway came in, there was vegetation management. We have to manage uh, vegetation to an extent to keep it out of the things that we find important. But really the birth of utility vegetation management in the US came with the telegraph. We never really saw such a widespread connected grid uh, before the telegraph. That was kind of our, our first uh, glimpse at it. And this is a really interesting map from 1848 of the, um, the lines at the time, which I know it's a little bit difficult to see. I've even considered going back over this with red so you can see it a little bit better. But um, that's kind of where we started. Now the electric power grid um, is one of the engineering feats of the world uh, in the United States. Um, the grid started very, very uh, long ago in the 1880s and quickly grew into uh, a beast of a, um, of a machine across the United States. Um, I always like to ask people, how many uh, miles of power line do you think there are in the United States? Um, so while there are 200,000 miles of transmission right away, which are high voltage lines, um, the distribution lines that come to your home, uh, we have over 5.5 million miles of those lines. So this is, this is an impressive grid and it takes a uh, dynamic, engaged workforce to uh, manage such a, a large grid. So utility vegetation management was something, it wasn't really at the forefront of a lot of utilities. It was a consideration and it was a high cost, but it wasn't something that we were looking to get ahead of. It was, we were working on kind of a reactive um, planning system before we saw the blackout in 2003. Um, this really changed utility vegetation management um, and put a bit of a, a spotlight on it. Um, so th this was the second largest blackout in history. The first one being, I believe, um, a blackout that happened in Brazil. Um, so this left 50 million without power. Um, and it was determined that um, the utility failed to manage adequate tree growth in its right of way. What happened was actually a series of unfortunate events uh, is what it really boils down to. It was an incredibly hot day in Ohio. And so everybody was using their AC. And when there's a strain on the, um, the grid like that, it can cause a uh, sag in the power lines. Um, so what it boiled down to is that that was happening and there was a decent amount of sag. And typically there would be a program that would catch that there's a heavy load on a line and make it so that the utility can switch over uh, some of that load and cause a little bit less of that, that uh, sag, but that wasn't caught. The, the bug in the software did not catch that. And so the line did fall into vegetation um, and it caused a, a rippling domino effect across the grid because most of our grid is connected in North America. And so because of one 
area that vegetation was high in. Um, it caused this ripple effect, like I said, uh, leading to 50 million without power. So this started um, some of the most severe regulations we had seen in the utility world at that point. And so, you know, you can be fined a million dollars a day for being outside of compliance. So all of a sudden this um, system where we really just kind of make sure that there's not a significant outage, we were just looking for things that could maybe fall into the lines. All of a sudden we needed to have a clear bed under the lines as well um, and widened right of ways. So at the core of utility vegetation management is safety. That is, that is the core of what we do. Um, and tree work is dangerous. It's one of the highest risk vocations in the United States. And there are a lot of, lot of different um, scary things that can happen to you when you're working in and around power. You've gotta be very uh, aware of your surroundings. So a lot of times we see our power lines and, you know, I know before I was in this industry, I didn't, never really gave them a second thought, but it's um, it can be a really dangerous industry, especially during um, power outages, during storms, during fire, you know, so there's, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, and back in the 60s, we were seeing a, a significant amount of incidents that helped us create some of the safety standards we adhere to today. So electrical safety, obviously, is a huge part of this industry. Uh, my company predominantly works with electric companies, around 50 electric utilities in the United States. And we have to understand um, exactly how dangerous this area or this workforce is and um, to safely manage the area. So one of the biggest things to know is your minimum approach distances in accordance to voltage. So that that's incredibly important. Uh, job briefings are becoming something that is standardized across the industry. Um, you could say that of some areas, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, but now it is becoming a, a huge thing. So that kind of goes back to my first safety talk is before you start work, talking about what you're going to be doing, even if it's something routine, even if it's something you've done a hundred times, you know, just talking through it with yourself, with your team before you go into it. And then having those uh, post-job reviews, how can you do anything better and safer? So these are things that a utility arborist is going to be considering when they're in the field working um, and when they're, they're planning. So utility vegetation management as a whole. I always say utility vegetation managers are masters of diversity. You really have to have um, an understanding and know-how of many different things to pull your program together. Um, so you have to be able to be incredibly flexible. You could have the perfect system and have a storm, right? You could have the perfect system and have uh, equipment fail. So you have to be incredibly flexible and um, continue to plan because vegeta vegetation is dynamic. You can't always do the exact same plan every single year. You're gonna have to look at what you have and then apply the correct uh, containment measures to that area. Um, and in addition to that, you know, like I said, storms come through, um, that comes in with crisis planning. You're going to have to, um, stop what you're doing to contain the situation. And that may take days, that may take weeks. Um, I know that I worked on a restoration project after Hurricane Michael for five months. Um, so it can, it can take a lot of time. And then in addition to that, being able to schedule, budget, and contract constantly the work that is being done on a system. Um, so that obviously requires a lot of project management skills. And so I always say, long story short, it's very complicated. You know, it's, it's, you don't need to have one area of understanding. You need to understand each area very thoroughly to be able to manage right away effectively. So with that being said, maintenance strategies. Um, when, if you were just handed um, 
thousands of miles of right of way, what would you do? So there are a few different um, ways that people manage their right of way. One is preventive. So this would be trying to uh, maintain the right of way to, before an incident occurs, right? And then there's reactive. Um, that would be, we had an outage on in this area. It was vegetation related. We need to go address this area. And that may be something minor. That may be, you know, we've had, um, some blow in from a tree that's causing, you know, lights flickering, something like that. Um, and then there's predictive on condition um, planning strategies. This utilizes um, resources based on actual field conditions. So you, there's a, there are lots of ways that you can uh, read into what predictive on condition um, actually means. But it, at the end of the day, it's data. It's, it's data tracking and data management. So field data gathered um, with regular ground patrols, um, assessing the risk of trees in the right of way and off the right of way, because that, that's you know a huge part of it too, uh, especially with the flooding we've seen in the Carolinas down to Georgia and Florida, we're seeing a lot of large trees off right of way failing. Um, so that's, that's something you have to take into consideration as well. And um, you can supplement that with LIDAR, aerial photography, satellites, you know, that, that's becoming a huge part of the industry as well. So your maintenance cycles, um, that's basically the length of pruning. How long does it take uh, before you need to come back and repeat a, um, a prescribed pruning? And so a lot of what goes into that is area, um, tree species and growth rates specifically. Um, local weather patterns. I was just recently down in South Florida and there really is not a, um, an off season for them. Their growing season slows, uh, to a point when there's less rain, but they're growing, they're experiencing year round growth. And so even a smaller utility down there is spending more on, on vegetation management because if they don't, <laughs> trees will just grow right into the lines and cause power outages. Um, one way that you can look at how to uh, find the best cycle for your utility is by tracking past practices. So if there's an area, for example, if you've uh, pruned a tree incorrectly, you may have a lot of reactive shoots coming out of the tree into your power lines. Um, so, you know, that's something that maybe you want to avoid moving forward because now instead of trimming a couple of branches, um, you're going to be trimming basically a wall of tiny branches that are going to grow much faster than an established branch would grow. Um, and longer cycles, you know, may sound ideal unless um, you have a, a heavy growth area. Uh, it can lead to that heavier growth is going to lead to more costly pruning. Um, and it can also impact tree health at that point. When you're having to take a maximum cut because you only come through, you know, every seven or eight years, um, you could have a larger amount of failures on system. So just a little bit about utility rights of way, because sometimes I'm asked, why did the utility leave um, that branch that didn't go back to a proper lateral? Um, or why there's this tree directly under the lines that they keep pruning? Why do they keep pruning that? Well, a lot of this kind of goes back to the right-of-way itself. Um, if a right-of-way is only 20 feet wide, and I've got a tree that's off right-of-way that grows into the right-of-way, I may know that the best thing for this tree is to remove a branch all the way back to the trunk. Um, but if a homeowner does not agree with me, there's only so much of a wiggle room in there. And it, it does depend on how the utility has written out their agreements for the right of way or their legal easements. Um, but it, what it boils down to is negotiation um, and also what um, the utility is willing to do, what their budget looks like. It may not be, it may not make the most sense right now to remove a tree based on some of those factors. Um, even though, you know, right tree, right place is something a utility arborist is um, very, <laughs> comfortable saying says says quite a bit 
uh, we, we love trees. We are still arborists. We just don't want them um, in an areas where they can't thrive. And a utility right of way is not typically the best place for a tree. So utility pruning. So this is just any type of pruning that happens near utility facilities. And the objective of that is maintaining safe and reliable utility service, no matter what that utility may be. Um, so utility pruning takes into account species. So if I know that I've got a, a very fast growing species, I'm going to look for a more severe cut. If I have a slow growing species, I'm not going to be as interested. You know, if um, I'm looking at a magnolia, we're probably just going to have to take a little bit of that to maintain like a distri uh, distribution right of way. Um, whereas, you know, a box elder tree in Tennessee is going to grow much faster. And, you know, that might even be grounds for talking to somebody about a removal. Uh, we use uh, the ANSI A300 um, and ISA BMPs, you know, like that. that is fairly standard across our uh, industry. Um, many utilities write that into their scope of work for their, the tree care companies to adhere to. Um, we're just like everybody else. We want to prune to parent or proper lateral branches to reduce that sprouting I mentioned earlier. And um, we carefully consider uh, canopy um, removal, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things that we're, we are beholden to the space that we are provided. And also at, at the end of the day, we're not tree care, uh, individuals. This is, this is a risk mitigation situation. Um, our objective is again, maintaining safe and reliable utility service. Um, then you got to take into account failure rate, um, of your trees. If you tree, see a tree in significant decline, that may be something you try to negotiate removal for. Same thing with uh, dead and in decline uh, branches. A lot of people ask me why utilities top trees, and I've got to tell you, uh, nobody's nobody's topping trees. The only situation where you may see something around over topping hat rack, anything like that, is on trees that have been historically pruned that way. Um, trees live a long time and our industry is fairly young. Um, so you still see um, effects of, of topping. But then again, there are those areas where you may have somebody who is not willing to remove a tree that is in a bad situation. Um, you know, trees are bad conductors, but they are conductors. If you have a tree in a power line, that is that it's a danger to you and your community, uh, not just from an outage standpoint, because they are bad conductors. Uh, risk of electric shock is, is, uh, is real when it comes to trees and power lines. So that's, uh, but anybody who does argue for topping, I, I threw a few things in there about why you shouldn't do it. Um, but like I said, unfortunately it was once uh, widely practiced in utility vegetation management. So clearance requirements in um, the right of way, again, change uh, depending on area, depending on voltage. Uh, there are a lot of things that um, go into that, uh, even down to just your planned maintenance. If you have uh, an area that you are visiting frequently, you know, then you might look at minimum uh, clearances off of that tree. Whereas if it is something that it's a, you're trying to go for a longer cycle, it may be maximum clearance. Uh, it, ju it just depends on the utility and the work specifications dictated to um, that area. Um, with all these variables in place, the utility arborist that is doing the planning and working uh, with property owners on the best solution, um, you have a lot of different ways you can look at a tree and look at proper maintenance. Uh, what may work for one utility in one area uh, may not work for another utility in another area. Um, so another thing I get asked about all the time is ground described pruning versus overhang. What it really boils down to is priority of the line. Um, you know, if you've got a, a main feeder line or a high voltage line, which usually on a high voltage line, not overhang isn't even a consideration because of our national and federal regulations in place. Um, 
it's one of those things that you have to monitor for failure. And so if it is on a priority line, it may make more sense to remove ground to sky, which would just mean trimming that entire side of that tree. Whereas if you have a lower priority line, like a single phase distribution line going down a dead end road, uh, overhangs probably something I wouldn't recommend addressing just because it will take so much extra time to um, remove those branches and it can impact tree health as well. So it's just, it's a dynamic, you know, conversation to have at the very least. When are we coming back to this area? Um, you know, is another consideration and how healthy is the tree that I'm looking at? Um, really the most cost-effective way of um, working with vegetation is to take into consideration all of these different um, factors before creating a policy that's just a, a blanket across, across the entire um, system. So again, I kind of already have touched on this a little bit as well, but to prune or remove. And basically, if it costs more to prune a tree than to remove it, a removal is a better choice. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, utility-friendly trees, uh, or trees, utility-friendly vegetation later on. At the end of the day, a tree is usually not compatible with an electric right-of-way. Um, and topping or hat rack or you know heavily having to prune a tree isn't good for the tree. It's much better to remove it and uh, replace with a tree that species that may be compatible or other compatible things like grasses and forbs. Um, one of the the best things to do though is to catch this before a tree becomes large and established. Small and young trees are incredibly less costly to remove. Uh, they take less time. They're less hazardous. Uh, they don't get to a point where they may cause an outage in the right-of-way. Um, and if they're small enough, they can also be relocated. Um, remove and replace programs are usually well received with the public. Um, we will remove this tree and we will give you XYZ that is compatible. Um, and you know, that, that can help you overall with your budget. But at the end of the day, budget has to be a huge factor in this. You could remove uh, many established trees on your system, but that's going to be incredibly costly. So it's one of those things that it's it just takes a lot of careful consideration. So now I'm going to move into integrated vegetation management. What is that? Um, you know, you've heard me talk about utility vegetation management. What makes this different? It's an approach to manage uh, vegetation on rights away that promotes herbaceous uh, plant diversity and reduces overall maintenance costs. Um, it also provides better control of invasive exotic species and has been proven to um, create a habitat rich environment for wildlife. Um, you know, this is, this is something that isn't a new approach to utility vegetation management. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but basically it's looking at, looking beyond pruning trees in your right-of-way, looking at what you can do to get some of these invasive species out of our right-of-way. You know, most of the time, the fastest growing nuisance plant in your area is an invasive species. Um, so if we can manage that, if we can mitigate those invasive species, it gives our native seed bank a chance at, you know, coming back into our right-of-ways. So a few effective control methods um, in utilizing IVM. You want to use an herbicide, first of all, that works for the species that you're trying to manage. Um, so it's it's a trial and error kind of thing. It's, one, it's something that you need to come in and do um, prescribed uh, test plots on different areas so you can see what works before you try to do something across system. Um, of course, you want to follow the application met methods prescribed on any of the labels. Um, look at the best time of the year for treatment. You know, there's no sense in using something that isn't going to be effective at certain times of the year based off of weather um, or and a few other factors. Um, you want to look at your best management practices, of course. Uh, and the biggest thing is to be patient. Uh, if you're utilizing herbicide in a right-of-way, you're not going to get overnight results. 
it's a slow process. And I tell people to look at it from a restoration perspective. Um, you're, you're slowly reclaiming an area and promoting a new uh, ecosystem, really. So I said that a lot of this is based off of uh, studies that have been done. This is the uh, leading study that is leaned on for the use of integrated vegetation management as a way to promote habitat in a right of way. Um, so this study began in 1953. It's called the SGL 33, but most people in my industry call it the Bramble and Burns study um, after two of the researchers that um, helped start it. So um, they wanted to measure the impact of vegetation management techniques within the utility right away on wildlife habitats. Predominantly what they were looking at was um, erosion and the use of herbicide. Um, as well as now they've started to add in uh, what does it look like from a fuel, uh, fuel uh, pollutant level, like how is fuel impacting um, soil and different things like that. And this project, like I said, this research project has been going on since 1953. It hasn't stopped. It's, it's continuing to add more and more layers to this data that we have that we can lean on. So it's been ongoing for over 60 years now. One of the um, best things to come out of this uh, study was the uh, idea and development of the wire border zone establishment. So in 1982, that was the first time we saw like the idea of this uh, vegetation method. Um, this, in, this approach, the goal of it is to encourage tree resistant forbs and um, grass cover in the wire zone, which is the area directly below the, the power lines, um, and then to have a buffer zone outside of that, and then have your trees outside of the right of way. Um, and this method has been proven to increase wildlife habitat and diversity in the right of way. Uh, so this is just a, a visual representation of what that looks like. So the wire zone there, that's an area that um, regulations do not allow for um, woody species anyway. So the idea is we don't want bare ground here, right? You know, like that's not, that's not good. That's bad from an erosion standpoint uh, that keeps ground open for more tree species to uh, come back up. So the idea is you're using a selective herbicide to reduce the woody species in the area and promote the grasses and forbs in an area. And then again, you're looking at the next zone and you're prescribing herbicide that reduces uh, the tall tree species, but allows the woody shrub species to uh, exist. And then you have your trees safely outside of your right-of-way, on the, on the edge of your right-of-way. So the Wildlife Research and Association with um, this, this study is pretty extensive. Um, they started to look at non-game species. So it, originally this was something that they were mostly looking at uh, game species in the, the original um, study. But the, um, this wire border zone management of the right-of-way provided habitat for native birds, especially um, early successional species like uh, your turkeys, um, butterflies, amphibians, and reptiles. And the other thing that we've seen is the promotion of native um, grasses and forbs. So you see a lot of native milkweed in right-of-ways, Rebecca, different things like that, just from eliminating those, um, those factors, you know, that shade cover for one, and then also opportunistic native species, you know, mitigating those to an extent um, and really creating a, a polyculture versus a monoculture in some of those um, right-of-way areas. Um, and like I said, today, the Bramble and Burns site is the longest continuous study measuring the effects of herbicide and mechanical vegetation management uh, practices on plant diversity. Um, this next slide is, kind of shows you what some of those key findings are, but I, if you are interested in this, I recommend going to the, the website that's uh, in the site below. But this is just an example of what uh, species life looks like in an untreated forest. So this would be outside of the right-of-way, just looking at a, at a forest versus a treated right-of-way. And one of the reasons it's so successful is because much of the United States did 
um, prior to us coming and creating some of these um, more timbered areas was a lot of grasslands. And um, we have many species that we see less of because of the loss of habitat. You know, um, quail, monarchs, you know, those are some of those like key species that you really think of that we don't see quite as much of. Um, they really benefit from having um, these grassland areas. And our utility rights of way, like I said, you know, that provides um, a large area for us to use for habitat creation and retention. So butterflies specifically um, use the flowering plants and right of ways for habitat. Um, one of the interesting things with monarch butterflies is um, mil while milkweed is a good species to have, if you plant a solid field of just milkweed, you're actually not going to get monarchs. Um, you, you've got to have a, a scattering of that species at a particular height is what we've actually been able to um, observe and study. And um, then it kind of, it creates this environment where they can thrive. Um, so herbicide and mowing, in addition to cycle appropriate herbicide treatments, help create that uh, close to, you know, ideal habitat for them. You want to have, you know, a variety of nectar plants, especially for monarchs as they travel. You know, that's, they need to have milkweeds um, for reproduction, but they also have to have uh, nectar producing plants to make their journey. Um, and the, the biggest takeaway I would say from this study is that the use of herbicide on right away had no detrimental impact on butterfly species or the total number of butterflies. What we've seen is it's actually when you use the right um, methods, when you're not using something like a non-selective herbicide bare ground treatment, you, we're seeing a, a production. You know, it's, it's the monarch species has actually done very well in the last few years in um, at least the in Eastern monarch species has. Uh, and a lot of people are attributing that to things like the Monarch CCAA, that it's a voluntary program that encourages utility rights of way to um, take into account the habitat and promote in a lot of these ways. So I hope that that wasn't too rapid fire for everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions and comments at this time, but also this is my contact information. So feel free to reach out to me anytime beyond this uh, webinar. That was great, Megan. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, I, I know Neil mentioned it when we got started, but this is the most attendees that we've had on one of these webinars, at least since I started helping out since January. Um, and I just wanted to say hello to the people of the world. We've got people from Australia and Italy and oh, wow. Singapore and Hong Kong and all over the U.S. So it's really cool. Um, clearly a lot of interest there. Um, so a reminder to everyone to put your questions in the chat and I will read them for Megan. Um, to get started, let's see. Okay. Our tree board would like to develop a positive relationship with our local electric utility. Where do we start? Um, I would reach out and try to find the vegetation manager of the utility and, you know, extend an, an offer out to them to open dialogue, to have a conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, how can my town help large trees coexist with utility lines? That's a difficult one. So it's um, large trees near your, your power lines are you know, they're going to require a, a careful touch for the most part. Um, but at the end of the day, the best place for a tree is outside of a utility right of way. Um, as an arborist, that is a hard thing to say. Um, I think that with our industry being so young, that that's one of the reasons we do see so many established trees in the right of way. Um, and moving away from that, we'll, we'll have a, a better right of way uh, in the future, hopefully, um, where we see less of those those large established trees um, in the right of way. Because at the end of the day, even if we're taking minimal uh, pruning off of a tree, we're still going to have to come back and prune that tree over and over again. 
Uh, one useful tool uh, can be uh, tree growth regulators. Um, they've been around for a really long time. It's a uh, it's something, it's an anti-gibberellin that goes into the tree and helps uh, reduce the growth rate. And so it, in, in some studies have shown to improve uh, tree health as well. And so when you do have one of those trees that industry, we call them a cycle buster. So if you have like a, a five-year cycle, um, you might have to do a mid-year prune on those larger established trees near, near the right-of-way. Um, it can help extend that out. And then you don't see people trimming quite as much. It's a little less stressful for the tree. Gotcha. Um, okay, someone asks, I know the difference between a right-of-way and an easement, but how or if does this affect an arborist's ability to manage these two areas? So at the end of the day, those are kind of your, your hard lines uh, in a lot of situations, especially if you're uh, working with a membership owned co-op uh, on a distribution right of way. So that's your, your lower voltage lines. Um, so if I go up to someone and say the best thing for this tree is this type of pruning um, and the tree is outside of the right of way, but it growing into the right of way, you can have a little bit of a disconnect on where the best thing is uh, could be for that tree. And on the flip side, then you also do have people who may want a more severe cut or request something like uh, a rollover for their tree, that, that topping practice. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things that it just requires a lot of negotiation on the arborist part um, to promote the best possible prune. But at the end of the day, we are, it's not a box, but that's, that's kind of what you're looking at. You've got your power lines in the middle and then you've got your your hard lines on the sides of the right of way um so anything that that's coming in that's that's what we're we're trying to get rid of um i, I hope that that answers the question there we go um Okay, someone asks, what are your thoughts on recommending that new developments bury their utilities underground and then being able to have large street trees within the right-of-ways? I think that that's a fantastic option. Anytime I travel, I can't help but look at power lines everywhere I go and look at how they're, you know, uh, managing their trees. Um, one consideration I would say is... Um, in addition to burying lines in neighborhoods, they should also look into um, sidewalks and streetways that don't uh, have a load bearing effect on the trees. Because one of the things that we're seeing is a lot of these developments are doing what many of our cities have done where the tree is planted in a box essentially. Um, so compaction is a huge issue, drainage is a huge issue. And so we're seeing a, a high fatality rate in the trees in a lot of these neighborhoods. So it's uh, it's just adding another layer to that planning. You know, if you want to have a beautiful neighborhood with large established trees um, and underground utilities, that, that's just a, another consideration. But I love it. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, wildfire hazard is critical in some parts of the US and world. How does utility vegetation management address fuels management as a priority? What practices can help reduce wildfire hazard or what practices may increase hazard like chipping or mastication of fuels and leaving on site? Mm. That is a very good question. So my, ex my area of expertise is not, uh, I haven't worked as much in the West as I have um, in, in the South. But yeah, fuels reduction is, is a huge conversation that we're having with many uh, utilities out there. So one of the things is um, when you're going in and clearing a new area, when you have an area that does have a high uh, a fuel level, um, one of the best things to do is mowing, uh, removing that vegetative material, um, and then following the uh, subsequent years with a uh, selective herbicide that can promote native species. Um, but we're also, another consideration that goes into that is the grassland fires that we're seeing more and more of, especially in Texas and Texas, Oklahoma and Colorado. 
Um, so I think that we're still learning. I think that there are a lot of different uh, approaches to fuels management. I know that one of the, the best things we can do is to um, reduce the amount of invasive woody species in an area and promote some of those uh, lower fuel load uh, grasses and forbs uh, in the right of way. And IVM is a, a great tool for that. Okay, uh, we've got one more question I'm going to read, but we still have about 10 minutes. So if anyone else uh, wants to ask Megan something, just throw that in the chat. Um, to what level does a utility company have a duty to remove right away trees that threaten public safety, but do not pose a threat to the delivery of safe and reliable electricity? Uh, typically, no duty. Um, this, that's it, the difference between like a electric utility and, and a city owned tree is that's the city's tree, right? Um, so I, I'd say that that's where most of that, that disconnect is. You know, if you've got a neighbor with a large tree and it falls in on your property, a lot of times, uh, depending on the state and the regulations in place, um, your neighbor is liable for the damages, right? It fell from their yard into your yard. Um, that's where we see many of the uh, ways that utility developed right of way and easements wasn't taking into consideration um, tree ownership, right? Uh, they're looking at land. And so especially if it's a tree outside of that, that right of way, there, there's no obligation there to mitigate that risk. If they're only looking at uh, risk in relation to the power lines and reliability. Okay, um, there's no new question, so I actually have a question. <laughs> All right, um, yeah. and I'm sorry if you. I was I'm, I was doing some background stuff, so I'm sorry if you addressed this. But when you were talking okay. about, um, especially like quail and butterflies and managing uh, for those, I was curious if you ever partner or if ACRT ever partners with like um, state wildlife agencies or NGOs. Um, like, for example, I used to work for the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. Okay. Um, okay. And I was just curious if you've ever partnered with those kinds of organizations to get that kind of like on the ground work done mm -hmm. that would benefit, you know, wildlife and invertebrates and, and whatnot. Right. So um, when ACRT was first founded, the R in ACRT did stand for research. And that was something we, we heavily partnered with environmental companies and organizations on different um, measures that were being taken. Uh, we uh, have a research and science and innovation team, and that's specifically what they do is work on um, those initiatives. And I know that we have a handful of, of partnerships out there, um, including one with the, uh, oh, they don't work directly with this team, so the direct names are going to probably be lost on me. But Dr. Anan Prasad is uh, the director of research and science and innovation with my team. Um, I know that that's that's an effort that he works on very heavily, and we do have a client in the Northeast that will be um, that will have a forward-facing website cataloging every native species, invasive species, uh, in their rights of way. Um, so that, that will be really interesting to see and see if other uh, utilities consider something like that so that the public can see that we're looking at more than just the trees. We are looking at, you know, the grass species, the, the forbs there, um, and other, other species um, in the right of way. But um, he is a uh, sitting professor in Gainesville, Florida. Um, and I know that he has many efforts that are going on with that university in particular. Um, but that, that is one of the things his team does is look at beyond, I mean, even beyond the plants, you know, they're, they're looking, he's an entomologist. And so looking at the, uh, the bug species there, um, down to soil and water in the right of way as well. Very cool. Thank you for indulging me. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. I've got two more things popped up. Not really a question, but more of an observation. There needs to be more emphasis on right tree, right place. 
It drives me crazy seeing big shade trees planted directly under lines, often by other tree companies and landscapers. Absolutely. I think that the green industry has a lot of silos, you know, like I, I started off in, um, on the horticulture side of things. I did a lot of landscape designs. I never asked anybody, do you have overhead utilities? You know, I have people bring me um, pictures of their house and measurements and things like that, but that was just not a consideration of mine at all. I'd never thought about overhead utilities. I didn't think about their service drop um, or about uh, utilities that may be on the roadways near them. Um, so I think that that's definitely uh, a conversation I've been trying to uh, have with more and more people is, you know, when you're planning an area, you need to take all considerations uh, for what's below the ground with your below ground utilities and what's above you. Uh, that It also drives me crazy because I, you know, like, like I said, I'm, I love plants. Um, I don't want to remove a large shade tree. Um, but at the end of the day, continuous pruning over years and years is not um, the best thing for tree health. So I think that um, remove and replace programs help promote public education, but it's something that we can just be mindful of when we are talking with other people um, and when we're planning in our everyday life, whether we're planning for a city or a private citizen or um, you know, any other planning projects. You said you had another one? Yep, um, last one. Are there any good examples of partnerships or management strategies for really tall trees? We are in the Pacific Northwest and have difficulties with disease centers up mm. to 100 to 200 feet from the lines, far outside the row or easement causing outages. Oh, sorry, the right away or easement. Yeah, yeah. Um, so can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yep. Are there any good examples of partnerships or management strategies for okay. really tall trees? We're in the Pacific Northwest and have difficulties with disease centers up to 100 to 200 feet from the lines or outside of yeah, the that is Yeah, that is, that is uh, significant. Um, I think that a lot of that would come down to negotiating with property owners or government agencies that may own that land. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's not really a cookie cutter solution. Uh, I know that in the Carolinas, that was one of the things I was doing. I was identifying those hazard trees that were well off right of way, not quite as far off right away, I think, as yours. Um, but that was contacting landowners and uh, explaining to them, like, one, we want to remove this and we'll handle the cost of removing this. Um, and then explaining why we want to remove it, you know, like this tree has failed, you know, is, is part of that conversation. Um, and so it really, it kind of is just a negotiation based on um, what you're able to do with your budget to remove, you know, some of those large trees and then also the negotiation process with the property owners. All right, that is all the questions we have. I'm gonna ask that Neil hop on and- um, All right, I'll stop sharing my screen. Take over, y'all yeah, throw up this last slide. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Alisa. And thank you, Megan, for an outstanding talk. I've seen some of the comments and hope you get a chance to glance at them. All of them are very positive, good information. And um, I will say that uh, I'm so pleased we had this presentation today. Uh, this is often a controversial and then sometimes an adversarial issue for those of us that love trees and those of us who have a, a duty to provide safe and reliable energy uh, delivery service. And a lot of times, uh, Megan, the breakdown is in communications and misunderstandings and not listening to the other side. So I hope this is a step forward and maybe helping you out there in the audience uh, learn from this and if you're in the utility sector, uh, we encourage you to get involved with your state and your local community tree program. Sit at the table. And if you're on the community tree side, uh, seek out your utility service provider and engage them in your program. And, and it's a win-win for everybody. 
Um, and with that being said, I want to give a shout out to Jeremy Goldsby. He didn't expect me to say this, uh, but he is the reason, Megan, that you're speaking to us today on this topic. We asked him, he's with the Middle Tennessee Electric Membership Co-op. It's a title that's as long as you're the company you work for, but they're outstanding uh, energy electric service provider in Middle Tennessee. A lot of their people are certified arborists. Jeremy sits on our Tennessee Urban Forestry Council board. And uh, we appreciate Jeremy suggesting uh, you as a speaker and, and he may not know this, but we're gonna call on him to give a presentation next year on what the Middle Tennessee Electric Co-op uh, is doing regarding trees and electricity. Uh, if you need CEUs for this program uh, and uh, you did not submit that information, your name and certification number, I say certification number, please do that now. Uh, via email or in the chat room. I think Elise is going to keep the chat room open a little bit longer. We have probably over 24 that have done it so far, but we will take care of it from there and submit that to the International Society of Arboriculture. So next slide. Uh, we want to thank uh, Megan once again. Fantastic presentation. We all learned a lot. We may be calling on her in the future for uh, future ideas and topics. Uh, Megan, uh, our invitation is open. So if there's a hot issue you think you could help us with, we'd love to uh, share that with our audience. Now, next month, I want to give a, a little promotion on that. We have Dr. James Landmere. We always are switching from one tree to the next with our topics. He is an international renowned expert on phytoremediation. Uh, he's written a textbook. I don't have the screen on there that uh, addresses this. I have a copy in front of me right now, but this is a key issue in our states with our contaminated soils. The thing, the problems with our ecosystems, we don't see because it's below ground, but trees can help be a solution to help detect, remediate and prevent contamination of our, our central soil ecosystem. And I'm looking forward to this talk immensely, but we were able to squeeze in his schedule to give a talk next month on July 21st. Please jot that down and the uh, registration information. Uh, Elisa, uh, that'll be open probably in a few days. Uh, we want you to uh, register for that, to, that same link. So once again, thank you to our speaker and to Elisa, to uh, Jeremy and all of you that uh, sat in on this presentation. Be safe, be cool, and we'll see you next month.